Hello and welcome to Jason's Macintosh Museum. I'm Jason, your host, and today we're looking at a Macintosh 2X from 1988. The Macintosh 2X was basically an updated version of the Macintosh 2 that came out in 1987. If you put a Macintosh 2 and a 2X side by side, they look almost identical. In fact, they share exactly the same case. They have the same internal layout for all their components. In fact, they share quite a few internal components as well. And they have basically the same level of expandability because both had six internal new bus slots. But that's where the similarities end. Because the 2X featured many internal improvements over the 2 that boosted both performance and usability. And a lot of these were in fact a first for any model of Macintosh. The first improvement of the Macintosh 2X over the Macintosh 2 was the fitment of Motorola's 68030 CPU and 68882 numeric coprocessor, both clocked at 16 megahertz in this case. And these took the place of the 68020 CPU and 68881 numeric coprocessor that was used in the Macintosh 2. Now there were a few advantages to doing this. Number one, it was a little bit faster because even though it was still clocked at 16 megahertz, the 030, due to its more efficient internal architecture and having a larger um, CPU cache, did provide a slight boost in performance. But the other main improvement was because the 68030 had a built-in paged memory management unit, you got virtual memory support as standard. Admittedly though, if you were using System 6 with the 2X, as you would have done when the system was new in 1988, you didn't have virtual memory support in the software in terms of the operating system itself. Oper the Mac OS didn't in fact support virtual memory natively until System 7 in 1991. Although having said that, I believe there were some third-party add-ons for System 6 that enabled virtual memory, but you didn't get it officially with the OS until 1991. But at least the support was there in the hardware. And the other major improvement was, and this was also a first for any Macintosh, was the fitment of Apple's 1.4 megabyte SuperDrive as standard. And this allowed, first of all, the use of 1.4 megabyte um, disks for, for data storage, but it also enabled for the first time the ability of the Mac to read and write to PC or DOS format 720K and 1.4 megabyte disks. And this was a big selling point back in the day because Apple stressed the benefits of being able to exchange data between your Macintosh and a, and a DOS PC back and forth. So that was quite an advantage. But other than that, there weren't any other major changes. But it, of course, did keep a lot of the nice features of the Macintosh 2, which was the large desktop case that had six internal new bus slots. And remember, the 2X was one of only three models of Macintosh that ever had six internal new bus slots. The other two, of course, being the Macintosh 2 and the Macintosh 2 FX. You also had the provision for one or two internal floppy drives in addition to an internal hard disk, which was also quite, uh, quite useful. So, some basic stats on the 2X. It was launched in September of 1988 and was discontinued in October of 1990. It cost between seven and nine thousand US dollars for a, for a system. Uh, that really depended on whether you had the internal hard disk or not. It came with one megabyte of memory as standard, expandable up to eventually up to 128 megabytes, in fact. And it came with an optional uh, 40 or 80, I believe, megabyte hard disk. So, as I mentioned, it had the Motorola 68030 CPU and 68882 numeric coprocessor, both clocked at 16 megahertz. And it's also worth noting that just like the 2 and the 2FX, the 2X has no onboard video, so you have to use a video card in one of the new bus slots. So that's really all there is to say about the Macintosh 2X. So what we'll do now is have a closer look at it. Here is the front view of the Macintosh 2X. 
and you can see that it looks very much like the Macintosh 2. As I mentioned, the casing is exactly the same. So starting from the top, we have the power LED over here on the top left. We then have the cutouts for the single or dual internal floppy drives. And of course with the 2X, you got 1.4 megabyte super drives as standard, although you could in fact fit an 800K drive to the 2X and it would still work as an 800K drive. And then down here we have the Apple logo and Macintosh 2X nameplate. And that's, that's about it for the front. There's really not much to, uh, not much to talk about. Uh, there's certainly nothing on the side, so uh, we'll switch over and we'll have a look at the back. Here is the rear view of the Macintosh 2X. And so starting from the top, we have the, the top cover latch that you have to uh, push in on to remove the top cover. Remember there's one there and there's one on the other side. Then over here we have the serial number and production information barcode label. So we can see from this it was produced uh, in the first week of 1989 at Apple's Fremont, California plant. We have an air vent here. Then over here we have the slot covers for the new bus slots. Remember there are six of them on the 2X. We can see one of them is occupied by a, uh, by a video card there. Over here we have the power inlet and monitor power output port. So this is an auto ranging power supply. Then over here we have the power on switch and just like the 2 and the 2FX, the 2X supports soft power so we can turn it on either from the power key on the keyboard or from this switch here. But notice that unlike the, the, 2X, sorry, the 2CX and the 2CI, there's no provision for locking the power button in the on position which is a bit of a, uh, bit of a shame. Over here we have the ports, we have audio out, two ADB, printer and modem serial ports, external SCSI, and that's about it. Oh, we have a security lock uh, connector here, but that's, uh, that's about it for the back of the 2X. So now we all take it apart. Taking a Macintosh 2X apart is identical in fact to taking a 2 or a 2FX apart because they share the same case and they have the same internal layout for all of their components. So the first step is to remove the top cover and to do that we have two latches, little um, clips on the back, push in on those, lift the back of the top cover up, lift it up to about here and then you can carefully release it from the front and off it comes. So I'll just rotate this so it's facing the front. So what we have, power supply here, new bus slots here, video card here, one or two floppy drives here, hard disk here and the logic board on the bottom. So what we'll do first is take out any of the new bus cards. So we'll take out the video card. We just rock it back and forth to release it. And there's the video card out. <clears throat> now what we need to do next is remove the bracket that holds the floppy drives and hard disk. So we'll connect, disconnect all of the data cables for those. Plug the floppy drive. Take that out. And unplug the hard disk data and power cables. What we can now do is take out four screws, two up here and two here, to remove the drive carrier bracket. So now we have the screws removed, we can lift the bracket straight out and it takes the hard disk and floppy drives with it. Now, if you wanted to remove the floppy drive from the bracket, you simply undo 
this screw here and the bracket, the floppy drive bracket, comes off. And with the hard disk it's the same thing. You take out these two screws here and this entire bracket comes off with the hard disk. So we'll set that aside. What we'll now do is take out the power supply. We have one screw to remove, which is down, down here. So we'll take that out. Make sure to unplug the power connector. Just pull on it gently. We can slide the power supply forwards now and then lift it straight out. So there is the power supply out of the case. We'll take out these uh, the data and power cables for the hard disk just to give us a bit more room. Next, we'll take out we'll take out the speaker down here, unplug it, and there are two there are two clips. So you can see one there and one there. We have to very carefully pull back on while lifting the speaker up. There we are. The speaker is now free. And finally, we need to take out the logic board. Now to do that, we have one screw here, one screw here, and then we have a whole series of little plastic clips around the board that have to be very carefully um, moved out of position or pulled back on while lifting up on the board. So we'll take the screws out first. There we are. Now, to get the board out, we should probably take these uh, expansion slot uh, covers out as well. Now to get the board out, we have to very gently lift up on the board without exerting too much force while pushing back or pushing in this direction each of these little plastic clips. And as you do that, the board will start to, to pop up. It's important you, you take your time when you, when you do this. And eventually the board will, will free itself. There we are. We can now lift it straight out of the system. So there we are. Let's put that down here. And finally, we can take out the protective uh, covering, little plastic uh, sheet here. And that's it. The machine is now completely disassembled. So now, let's have a closer look at all the components. Here is the logic board out of the Macintosh 2X. And if you're wondering what the wires are up here, the black and red uh, wires, uh, those are actually my improvised uh, battery holders, uh, which we'll uh, come to in a moment. Starting from the top, we have the Macintosh 2X nameplate, or name tag, and the data there, Apple computer, copyright 1988. We have all the ports up on the top of the board. We have the power switch there. And also that green wire you see there is actually a jumper wire I had to run to get the power on circuitry working, so uh, just uh, ignore that. ADB controller here. Uh, I'm not sure what that chip is. I think it's got something to do with serial ports. We've got the serial port controllers or transceivers there. SCSI controller there. And what else? Uh, here we have the six new bus expansion slots. And then over here we have the place where the batteries would normally go. Now, just like the 2 and the 2FX, the 2X has a unique power on, system, or power on circuit design, whereby the power supply unit does not provide a trickle current or trickle voltage, or standby voltage I should say, to the logic board to keep the power on circuitry powered up. 
So what this means is that the board itself has to supply its own power to that circuitry so that soft power can work and then it can kick on the main power supply. And on these three machines, the two, the 2X and the 2FX, this was done by having two 3 volt batteries on the logic board. And in fact, this is the type of battery that would have originally been on the board. They normally used uh, 3 volt VATA lithium batteries. You can see one there, hopefully. Now there would have been two of these on the board, one of which was used to <clears throat> keep the PRAM backed up, as is the case in most other Macs, but the second one was actually used in conjunction with the, uh, with, with the first battery to give five or six volts to the power supply so that when you turn the system on, it would actually start up. So this, of course, presents a problem. When the batteries fail, then you can't start the system up. So you must have working batteries on the logic board in order for the power-up circuitry to function. So what I've done instead is I've actually wired in two battery holders, look like this, each of which holds two AA cells to give me the three volts that I need for each battery. So by doing this, I can still power the system up normally. Now over here we have placeholders for ROM chips. But in this case, the ROM for the 2X is actually on a SIM that sits here. And next to that are the eight 30-pin SIM slots for memory expansion. And moving over from there, we have the new bus controller here. The connectors for the two internal floppy disks. Clock crystals there. Let me move these battery holders out of the way. There we go. Uh, another glue logic uh, chip there. Uh, not much there. Moving down from there. This is the numeric coprocessor, the Motorola 68882. Um, a bit hard to read that, but it is a 68882 running at 16 megahertz. And then to the left of that, we have the main CPU, the Motorola 68030, running at 16 megahertz. And then we've got the Apple Sound chip there, and uh, the IWM, that's the uh, floppy controller, known as the integrated WAS machine. Uh, but in this case, it would actually be an SWIM because the SWIM is the chip that supports 1.4 megabyte super drives. And we've got the power supply connector there. And uh, what else? Oh, there's the serial number of the, of the board. And I think that's about it. I'll speak a connector there and probably more sound chips there. And that's, that's about it. So that's the logic board out of the Macintosh 2X. So we'll have a look now at the disk drives. Now normally I don't look at the floppy drives in these uh, old Macs because normally they're all more or less identical. But because the 2X was the first Mac ever to use a, the 1.4 megabyte super drive, I thought it might be a good idea to have a closer look at the disk drive itself. So this is the early generation 1.4 megabyte super drive, and this was known as an auto-inject drive. Now what that means is that this is the type of drive whereby when you insert a disk, it will actually pull the disk in just as you're about to insert it all the way. It actually pulls the disk and latches it into the assembly. So to demonstrate that, I'll get a, uh, I'll get a disk here. And as I insert it, you will see that before I insert it all the way, the mechanism will clunk and pull the disc in. So you can see that I didn't actually have to insert it all the way for it to load. I only inserted it at about a centimetre, and as soon as I trip the mechanism, it pulls the disc in. So that's known as auto-inject. Now there was a later version of this drive known as manual inject, which was used on machines or used on Macs 
from about 1993 or so onwards. And those drives required you, a bit like the drives you find on DOS machines, it required you to insert the disk all the way in before it would actually drop down and latch into the mechanism. So I would say that they switched over because the manual inject drives were a lot simpler and cheaper to make because the loading mechanism of this is actually quite complicated. So what we have here is we have the, uh, we've got the loading mechanism over here. Oh, let's move just the camera there. So we've got the loading mechanism over here. And that's basically all, all these levers and uh, rods are all there to, to automatically pull the disc in. You've got the read-write head up there. Of course, there's another one beneath it for the bottom side of the disc. Uh, you've got the worm drive there, which moves the head assembly back and forth across the disc, controlled by a stepper motor here. And then we have the eject motor here, which in conjunction with the reduction gear set, actually ejects the disc automatically. So that's the top view of the drive, and on the bottom, not much to really see there, we've got the, the circuit board, and we've got the information tag on the drive. So this one has a blue label indicating that it's a first generation, I believe, 1.4 megabyte super drive. Sony model, what model is that? Model MPF75W, made in Japan. And assuming that this barcode label format is the same as what Apple used for their main systems, this would have been produced in, uh, let's see, whoops, the 19th week of 1991. So that sounds, uh, sounds plausible. So that's the, that's the floppy drive out of the Macintosh 2X. So... Now we'll have a look at the hard disk. Now an interesting fact about the hard disks used in the Macintosh 2, 2X and 2FX was that you could use either a five and a quarter inch or three and a half inch form factor drive. And you can see what we have here is the drive mounting bracket from the 2X and you can see that this is where the hard drive would normally sit. And you can see that we actually have two sets of mounting tabs or mounting holes these two at the bottom, in conjunction with the two screws up here, would have been used when mounting a five and a quarter inch hard disk. But these two mounting holes, in conjunction with these two screws, were used when mounting a three and a half inch disk. Because from what I understand, early production Macintosh 2s and 2Xs all used five and a quarter inch hard disks, but they then transitioned over partway through the production run, I believe, to three and a half inch discs. And that necessitated a different mounting bracket. So let me find the mounting bracket here for the hard disk, which is this. This is the mounting bracket that was used when mounting a three and a half inch hard disk into a Macintosh 2, 2X or 2FX. And you can see that it will sit in these two slots and be secured by these two screws at the top. So as for the hard disk itself, this 2X was fitted with a 80 megabyte quantum, three and a half inch hard disk. So you can see it's a quantum pro drive. And this was an 80 megabyte voice coil activate, actuated hard disk. So it was actually quite fast in its day. So on the back, whoops, <laughs> on the back you can see we have uh, the controller. So it's a 50 pin SCSI disc, as you'd expect. Quantum, made in Japan, copyright 1988. And the ROM, copyright 1988. So that's the, that's the hard disk. 
out of the 2x. So what we'll do now is have a quick look at the video card. Here is the video card out of the Macintosh 2x. And this is the standard Macintosh 2 series video card known as the, the Toby card that was fitted, I think, as standard to the Macintosh 2 and to the 2x. So it's a simple, um, non-accelerated uh, frame buffer card that gives you 8-bit colour at 640 by 480 resolution. And I believe if you expand the video memory over here, I think, actually having said that, I think at the moment you can only get 4-bit colour until you expand the memory. So I think you'd get 16 colours of that resolution by default, and if you expand the memory, you'd get 8-bit or 256 colours at that resolution. So there's the memory expansion there. There's the onboard video memory there. That's the frame buffer controller there. That's uh, various logic there. That's the new bus connector down there. Uh, clock crystals there. There's the serial number of the card. There's a digital to analog converter or RAM DAC. There's information tag, Apple Computer, Macintosh 2 video card. There's the standard 15-pin, uh, I think it is, uh, Macintosh monitor connector. And there's the ROM chip. So a pretty simple um, video card. Uh, but of course, with any of the Macintosh 2 series that use Nubus, you can always install a more powerful video card such as an 824 or an 824GC or even a Radius uh, card as well. But this 2X has the standard video card. So that concludes part one of the video series on the Macintosh 2X. So in the next video in this series, I'll reassemble the Macintosh 2X, start it up, and play a few more old Macintosh games. So hope you enjoyed the video. And thank you for watching and stay tuned for part two.